Hi, I'm Tony Van Veen, CEO of Dismakers. You know, I started at Dismakers entry level way back in 1987. And of all the amazing technologies I have witnessed over almost 40 years, one of the most amazing concepts is how that single groove in a vinyl record can turn into such richness in sound coming out of your speaker. But how does your music get into that groove in the first place? That, my friend, is what I'm going to be showing you today. I want to start by saying that one of the reasons I am amazed at this process is because even after all these years in the biz, I still don't actually fully understand how it works. I'm not a recording engineer, a mastering engineer, or any kind of engineer for that matter. I started out as a simple drummer. I learned the business side at Dismakers, and now as CEO, I am, I guess, a sort of jack of all trades, master of none. Fortunately, I have some really smart people around me who do understand this stuff. So let me start by explaining how a record makes sound. As you may know, when we hear sound, it's simple vibrations in the ear. These vibrations are caused by sound waves. The groove in a record is a physical representation of those sound waves. When the stylus of a turntable hits the record, the groove causes the stylus to wiggle. To oversimplify it, this wiggling creates mechanical energy, which is converted into electrical energy, which, when amplified significantly by an amplifier, turns into the sound of Vivaldi, of Miles Davis, Jay-Z, Slayer, Taylor Swift, or any other artist coming from your speaker. One interesting tidbit that most of you might not know is each side of the groove wall represents one channel of your stereo sound. The sound from the right channel or the right speaker is carried by the groove wall that's the closest to the outside of the record and the left channel is the groove wall closest to the center. Interesting, no? So how do we get your music into a groove that can ultimately be pressed into a record? That process is what we call mastering. And to do that, we simply reverse the flow on the playback process that I just described. We start with a lacquer acetate. This is really a really flat metal disc coated with really, really flat and smooth lacquer. Lacquer is softer than vinyl, which allows us to cut the groove into it. As you can see here, the lacquer gets a careful visual check and the mastering engineer chooses the best side to cut. That lacquer is put on a cutting lathe, which is basically a big, heavy, stable turntable. The mastering engineer, in this case, legendary Philadelphia producer Phil Niccolo of Studio 4 fame, will carefully listen to the recording that you've supplied, how long the music is, what its sonic properties are, bass, treble, volume, and then set an EQ and volume level, a cutting level, which determines the playback level that is optimal for that recording. Instead of the playback stylus that a record player has, the cutting lathe has a cutting head, usually with a diamond cutting stylus. When your recording is played back, the electrical energy of the sound waves is converted into mechanical energy that jiggles the cutting head in time with the sound waves. When the cutting head is dropped onto the lacquer, it cuts a groove representing the sonic qualities of the music being played back. You can see that on this piece of video that I'm about to show, and you can even hear the music that is being cut into the lacquer. Let's take a look and a listen. Nifty, right? What happens with the lacquer particles that are getting cut out of the master acetate? Well, there is a powerful vacuum tube attached to a hose right behind the cutting stylus that hoovers up all those particles because you certainly don't want those little chunks of lacquer lying around on your finished cut lacquer or on the cutting lathe. 
while the lacquer is being cut. The engineer alternates between carefully checking the playback levels of the recording to make sure they are appropriate for the mastering that's being done and checking the grooves that are being cut through a magnifying glass. After the lacquer is cut, we put it under a microscope to really check out the grooves. The depth of a groove determines your playback level, and the single biggest driver of playback level is the length of your music, of your recording. For optimal levels, you want the program on one single side of your album to be no longer than 22 minutes. The longer the program, the longer the groove, right, to play it all, the longer the groove, the closer together it has to be on the record, which means that it has to be cut shallower, since a shallower cut takes up less space, which means your playback levels will be lower the longer your program is. The main thing we check for on the microscope is no cross cuts. That's when one groove partially crosses over into the one next to it. When that happens during mastering, you will end up with a record that will skip as the stylus will easily jump from one groove to the next at the cross cut, which is where the groove wall is a little lower. After the microscope, there's another quick visual inspection and then the lacquer is carefully packaged for the next step, plating, also called electroplating, which is the process of making the actual metal stamper that gets mounted in the record press. I'm not going to show you that in this particular video. So when you look at all the steps it takes to cut a lacquer, plus the cost of materials, which are not cheap, and one thing to remember is that it takes two lacquer acetates to master an album, one for each side, plus the time to listen to the whole program ahead of time, to set the right levels and EQ, to do a test cut, then cut the album and in real time, and then QC and pack up the lacquer, it is easy to see how this is an expensive process. Most pressing plants do not cut their own lacquers, but they work with one or sometimes several independent mastering studios. That works well when you're doing large pressing runs for record labels because labels tend to have their own preference of mastering studio or recording engineer sometimes. But when we're doing small runs of 300, 200, even 100 units for independent artists like you, it is critical to control expenses, which is why our pressing plant cuts its own lacquers. This makes mastering still a relatively expensive part of the process in terms of materials and time required but at least the pressing operation covers all the overhead costs of the mastering studio. And that allows us to work close on margins and offer you the best prices on short run vinyl in the country. So that's it. I hope you found this little explanation of the mastering process helpful. I love watching the process. To my business brain, it's like magic happening, musical magic. If you want to make some of that magic with your music by putting it on vinyl, we're happy to help make that dream a reality. See you next time.